Vice Chancellor, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this case study this evening, which is all about making a difference through targeted social marketing. It revolves around an intervention that was undertaken in Brazil in communities engaging with young men um, in critical reflections about rigid norms related to manhood and which demonstrated a, a strong link between gender attitudes towards sexuality and HIV, risk behaviours such as non-condom use. And so the case study will focus on the implementation of what was called Program H, a 12-month quasi-experimental study conducted in low-income communities in Rio de Janeiro. However, before I talk about that program, I just want to give you a little background about the work of the Durex Network, just to set the scene. So for many years, Durex has been involved in and has supported public health campaigns around the world to raise the profile of safer sex, and in particular, that of condoms. And as a world leader, Durex has been committed to sharing knowledge and its expertise for the benefit of as many people as possible in the areas of sex and reproductive health and education. But it was in 2005 that I formalised all of this work under the Durex Network umbrella, continuing to raise the awareness of the safer sex message. Now, as the name suggests, the, the work of the Durex Network is working with like-minded organisations, institutions, individuals, all who can impact positively and encourage consistent condom use at the global level. Now for Durex, we specifically inspire and empower individuals to take responsibility for their own sexual health. But why do we need to do this? Well, here are some of the, the headline global statistics. HIV is well documented, and it is estimated that each day 7,000 people become infected with HIV. And disproportionately, that is affecting young women and girls more than, than boys. There are 345 million new cases of STIs each year, and half of which are to those aged 15 to 24. And a number of those people, around about 10%, actually represent themselves during the 12 months with reinfection. And that's despite being told of all the risks when they present themselves for treatment. Chlamydia is fast becoming the number one STI. And in the USA, for example, 400,000 teenagers become infected each year. And because it is asymptomatic, if left untreated, it can lead to major complications later in life. There are some 16 million adolescent girls who become mothers each and every year. And the issues that, lead, uh, th that this leads to are well documented. Here in the UK, we have the highest levels of teenage pregnancies in Europe. And globally, we're only second to the USA. And there is a staggering 50 million abortions each and every year. In England and Wales, one third of those abortions are repeat abortions. But if you go a little further afield to places such as Russia and Ukraine, for example, then abortions are in fact viewed as a main method of contraception. So it's not unusual to find women who have had at least 10, 12 abortions during their lifetime. And finally, let's not forget that there are 200 million women the world over who still have an unmet need for reproductive health services and birth control. Now under the Durex network, umbrella, there are four main areas, four main components. First of all, global partnerships, 
And the main partnership we have is with an organisation based in the Netherlands called Dance for Life, which uses music and dance to inspire young people to educate themselves in being informed about HIV and other STIs. We undertake extensive research and analysis, and some of you may be familiar with the global sex surveys and the face of global sex reports that Durex produces. And that they provide insight into many, many sexual issues. Just one of them being, why do people have unprotected sex with a partner for whom they do not know anything about their sexual history? What, why would people do that? Advocacy, promoting the category to various stakeholders, including the media and politicians and healthcare professionals and let's not forget the UN organisations as well, to make sure that condoms are well and truly on the international agenda. And finally, behaviour change, communication and social marketing, which is going to form the focal point of this, this evening's lecture. But it's not just sexual health where social marketing can deliver a difference and change attitude and behaviour. Here are some of the other challenges where a social marketing approach can make a huge difference to the health and well-being of individuals. Here in Salford, public health improvement teams currently develop, develop themed approaches to health improvement, working with GPs, the Salford Community Health, Salford City Council, and local agencies and community groups to influence things such as tobacco control, food and nutrition, and also physical activity. Since the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, which was held in Cairo, policymakers and those at the front, at the front line of the AIDS epidemic have increasingly endorsed improving men's access to programs and health services as a way to protect both men and their partners from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. But what is new and noteworthy are the interventions that encourage men to examine the detrimental social norms about manhood and to improve communication with their partners and to support women's roles in sexual decision making. Around the world, many young men aged 15 to 24 are at high risk of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and are victims and also perpetrators of sexual coercion and violence. Moreover, young men um, are less likely than young women to seek healthcare services, making it even more difficult to reach them with information and assistance. Many institutions, such as UNAIDS, have called for more effective and innovative strategies to incorporate men, particularly young men, into HIV and STI, but also violence prevention initiatives. Since 1993, more cases of AIDS in Brazil have been attributed to heterosexual intercourse compared to homosexual transmission. The proportion has increased from 17% to over 50% amongst the adult population. This increase has brought with it an alarming rise in the percentage of women affected by HIV. There is evidence that women are less likely to use a condom when having sex with a casual partner than compared to men. Adding to concerns that many women do not see themselves at being at risk of becoming infected with HIV. It, also, it has also become, in clear, become increasingly clear that young people are bearing the brunt of the epidemic and that the poor and those with a low level of education are at a higher risk of becoming affected. 
There's growing evidence that earlier socialization that promotes inequitable gender roles as the norm encourages risky behaviors amongst young men and women. Thus, addressing gender norms is increasingly recognized as a key strategy to increase condom use and prevent the spread of HIV. Common examples of gender norms for men include that they should have multiple sex partners and maintain control over their female partners. Women are often taught to be submissive and often do not have the power to negotiate safer sex with their male partners. Gender inequality in relationships where males have greater power than females can also lead to sexual coercion and physical violence, circumstances under which HIV protective behaviours are impossible to initiate and maintain. However, promoting social norms in favour of greater gender equity is challenging. Moreover, few interventions to promote gender equitable behaviour among young men and women have been evaluated and relatively little is known about how best to measure changes in gender norms and the effect of such changes on HIV protective and risk behaviours. To address these gaps, the Jurex Network collaborated with the US-based Horizons programme and Instituto Promundo, a Brazilian non-government organisation. Together with the support of the USAID and the MacArthur Foundation, and also with technical support from NGOs from Brazil and Mexico, such as Saludi Genero, Ecos and Papai. And that was all about forging a partnership known as the H Alliance to examine the effectiveness of interventions designed to improve young men's attitudes towards gender norms and to reduce HIV. Exploratory research led by Promundo involved mapping masculinity to better understand how men and women view what it means to be a male. A range of existing literature, studies and surveys from Latin America and elsewhere were reviewed. And this confirmed that boys and young men in Latin America are frequently socialized around a constellation of gender norms related to sexual and reproductive health, risk, sexuality, homophobia, fatherhood, use or acceptability of violence against women, and also participation in domestic chores. While there is variation uh, by setting, family and individual, extensive qualitative and ethnographic research indicates that there is remarkable consistency in the norms into which boys and young men are socialized across the region. Styles of interaction in intimate relationships are often rehearsed during adolescence and continue into adult relationships. Traditional masculinity embraces the belief that men have more sexual urges than women. Men have the right to decide when and where to have sex. Men should initiate sex. Unsafe or risky sex is more enjoyable than safer sex. And sex and reproductive health issues are a women's concern. And women should be submissive and accept their partner's sexual requests. In the process of interviewing men in Latin America, researchers identified individuals who questioned the prevailing views about manhood. Through in-depth interviews with those more gender-equitable men, the team sought to understand 
how it was that these particular men came to question the dominant paradigms. These men generally showed a high degree of self-reflection in the interviews, some awareness of the personal benefits of embracing gender equality, and usually had others around them, family members, valued peers, or an adult male who modelled gender equitable attitudes and behaviours. These men sometimes also had seen or experienced gender violence. Violence against a mother or a sister when they were children. Or perhaps they had used violence themselves against a female partner. The resulting emotional pain to themselves and others has caused them to oppose or question such violence. Now these research findings provide the conceptual framework for Program H. H is for homem, or hombre, which is the word for man in Portuguese and Spanish. And specifically, this formative research reinforced the need to work at the level of the individual, at the individual attitude and behavior change, by engaging young men in that critical reflection on the costs of traditional versions of masculinity and work at the local or social level, including amongst parents, service providers, the community, religious leaders, even the mass media and other influencers, all model those individual attitudes and behaviors. The programme focuses on young men rather than older men, since they potentially are more flexible. They have flexible views about gender and are just beginning their sexual lives or starting to develop those intimate relationships. But what behavioural goals are we looking to achieve? Programme H seeks to encourage men to seek relationships with women based on equality and also intimacy rather than sexual conquest. This includes believing that men and women have equal rights and that women have as much sexual desire and right to sexual agency as do men. Men seek to be involved fathers for those who are fathers or to be involved in caregiving. Men assume some responsibility for reproductive health and disease prevention. This includes taking the initiative to discuss reproductive health concerns with their partner, using condoms, or assisting their partner in acquiring an alternative contraceptive method. Gender equitable men will oppose violence against women Now, based on the research findings and direct experience of working with men in various parts of the Americas region, three strategies were developed to promote more gender equitable attitudes and behaviours amongst young men. Offering young men opportunities to interact with gender equitable role models in their own community setting. Promoting these more gender equitable attitudes in small group settings and in the greater community and group and individual activities that promote reflections about the histories that help young men perceive the costs of some of the traditional versions of masculinity. The intervention activities were selected to address each of the characteristics seen here with a gender focus. So gender equitable men are respectful to women. They, can, they show concern about the feelings and opinions of their sexual partners and seek that relationship based on equality. They believe men and women have those equal rights. They assume and share with their partners 
responsibility for reproductive health. And they seek to be domestic partners and fathers who are responsible for at least some of the household chores. Now in this setting in Brazil, we're talking about favelas, low-income communities, and it's quite often that you'll bump into an 18-year-old youth, a guy, and he could have two or three children by the time he's 18. In fact, the average age for losing one's virginity in these settings is 13. And the average age um, for, for girls is actually lower. Men are also opposed to violence against women in their intimate relations and are also, importantly, not homophobic. Now, changing behaviours to reflect positive gender roles has both short and long-term benefits. In the short term, young people can choose to avoid risky behaviours that may lead to disease, or even death in some instances, as well as sexual coercion and physical violence. In the longer term, changing machismo attitudes leads to a stronger and more rewarding relationship and more life choices for future generations. It is, however, critical to change these gender norms during the teenage years so it does not become established behaviour in adulthood. The key barriers to the target men adopting the desired behaviours includes a long cultural tradition that reinforces machismo, the lure of sexual gratification and also peer pressure. The perception that everyone is doing it, that everyone is having sex, is reinforced by entertainment media and representation in that media of machismo values. The trans-theoretical stages of change model underpins Programme H because the target audience must be moved through early stages of indecision. The programme begins with knowledge, eventually resulting in a shift of that basic belief about gender equity, thereby leading to behaviour changes. The programme also drew on the ecological model and its guidance regarding the importance of addressing key issues from multiple levels, from the individual to greater society. Hence, the interventions include the promotion of individual reflection, a peer and interpersonal group education, and a broader community-based component. Now, Programme H focuses on helping young men question those traditional norms related to manhood and on promoting their abilities to discuss and reflect on the costs of inequitable gender-related views and the advantages of more gender-equitable behaviours. And it involves these three key core components. The first, a validated curriculum that includes a manual and educational video for promoting attitude and behaviour change. A lifestyle social marketing campaign for use in the community. And also it was very important to engage with young men in particular and to promote healthcare services that were relevant to young men. The curriculum was developed and designed based on qualitative research with the study population. It included a 20-minute cartoon video and 70 activities developed and pre-tested with groups of young men aged 15 to 24. The activities in the manuals were designed to be carried out in a same-sex group and consist of role play, brainstorming exercises, discussion sessions, and also individual reflection. And activities were organised under these five 
key core themes from sex and reproductive health through fatherhood and caregiving through to emotions living with HIV and also from violence to peaceful coexistence. It's worth noting as well that the settings that we undertook these programmes in were heavily influenced by drug trafficking and that was one of the reasons why violence, not just gender violence, but also violence between gangs of young men was so prevalent. prevalent. Now the cartoon video used during the sessions called Once Upon a Boy tells the story of a young man from early childhood through adolescence and to early adulthood. The story highlights different experiences in the young man's life, including witnessing violence in the home, interaction with male peer groups, his first sexual experience, contracting a sexually transmitted infection, and facing an unplanned pregnancy. Like the educational activities, the video was widely field tested in Latin America and the Caribbean, and its content was based on previous qualitative research with young men in the region. What's interesting about this particular video is there are absolutely no words. It's just action. And that enables the moderator of the groups to be able to stop and pause at any stage and to engage in interaction with the young guys themselves to provoke thought, to provoke reflection. A very powerful tool. Now, five adult men were selected to facilitate the groups uh, and they were conducted with young men during once a week sessions for two hours each. And so each individual would have exposure to 28 hours of education. Each of the group facilitators would have prior experience of working with groups of youths from these low-income communities on gender and health issues. The facilitators had previously worked with Promundo and were selected in part because of their gender-sensitive and equitable perspectives. Facilitators were additionally trained by programme staff for a total of 24 hours, specifically on Programme H. And as part of training, they had to participate in edu educational activities that they would later facilitate. This way, they were able to reflect on their own attitude towards the issues being presented. During implementation, the coordinator of the Gender and Health Programme led weekly meetings with the workshop facilitators to discuss their progress and how the young men were reacting to the programme. And Promundo worked with local community groups, resident associations, local schools and a community radio station to recruit young men to participate in the intervention and to secure what was very important, and that is a safe space for the educational workshops. The participants were paid a, a small nominal sum, a stipend, equivalent of about seven US dollars per month, to reimburse them for trans transportation and for their time. Now, although participants were initially shy and uncomfortable with the structure of the activities, as the groups progressed, they became increasingly comfortable with contributing personal stories and opinions. However, in some sessions, there were conflicts and even physical violence between the participants because of the themes they were discussing, such as homophobia. Facilitators had to be trained and prepared to resolve these and to use these moments to promote further discussion in subsequent sessions. A behaviour change communication campaign to promote a more gender equitable lifestyle and to also reinforce those messages learned in the education group sessions was created. The campaign was called Ara Agar, 
which translates into English into in the heat of the moment. And it had the strap line attitude with a difference. The Oraga Condom uh, was actually conceived and developed by Durex in conjunction with the peer promoters, young men recruited at the community level to help develop and implement the campaign. These men identified preferred sources of information and cultural outlets in the community. They also crafted intervention messages about how cool and hip it was to be a more gender equitable man. The phrase was developed by the young men who frequently heard their peers say, everybody knows you shouldn't hit your girlfriend, but in the heat of the moment. Or, everybody knows that you should use a condom, but in the heat of the moment, you may forget or not have access to condoms. Condom use and negotiation are presented in the campaign as important elements of creating a more gender equitable lifestyle. While condoms were widely available in the Brazilian market, the youth participating in this program stated that they were targeted specifically at other people. There was nothing targeted at young men. And also, condoms in the, the rest of the uh, community were considered as being unaffordable. Now, taking cues from graffiti artists, branded condoms were sold in packs of three with a fun, colourful, colourful youth magazine developed by the young men themselves. And a different packaging format was used to differentiate these condoms from those others within the marketplace. Even the instructions for use were rewritten in a language that better suited the target audience. And in fact, special dispensation had to be gained from the government to actually run with words that were using slang from the, the favelas. These new condoms were strategically distributed in common cultural outlets for young men, including bars, community dances, and, and parties. Distribution was also secured in traditional retail outlets, together with music and clothing stores, drugstores, and pharmacies. It was important to convey that these condoms were credible and that distribution in those traditional outlets did just that. So if the guys could see condoms in a pharmacy or a drugstore, then it meant that this was a serious product. However, they were sourcing these condoms from alternative outlets. An advertising campaign was created with, with posters depicting young people from the community. Now this was highly successful because the public could relate to them more than they could perhaps with celebrities or models. We discussed using models um, from either music or fashion or football, but it was felt that to maintain maximum impact, it would be achieved by using the same peer promoters in the advertising. So members of the public could relate more easily to people they knew and saw within their own community. It made them feel real. The poster campaign was supplemented with community-based programming on radio and through community fairs, together with points of sale material to communicate an attitude with a difference. Real men use Ara Agar. The Lifestyle Social Marketing Campaign was launched only in Bangu to determine if it would lead to improved outcomes in support of the group education. Working in conjunction with the NGOs, Durex played a crucial part in the management of the programme 
through the provision of condoms and its technical expertise. Peer promoters were trained in selling and marketing and with their community, within their community, giving them the opportunity to enter the formal job market and to learn negotiation skills, earning them a commission and with profits channeled back into the programme, providing additional promotional activity. An Oregar kit containing lifestyle promotional materials, display stand, training manual, and the more importantly, the Aragar condoms, allowed easy replication in new settings. The use of condoms was promoted also through sketches and informative leaflets, posters and discussion groups on how to use and negotiate the correct use of condoms. The price was affordable and the product quality unsurpassed and consumer feedback quickly confirmed that Oragar condoms were the best quality condoms available in the community. Promoting male-friendly health services was also added to the programme as a third component in Bangu. The element involves training health professionals to provide services for young men and adapting the health service delivery programmes so that they are more appealing to men. And so we produce literature, uh, we engage with the health posts, the, the, the healthcare uh, staff in those health posts to ensure that they would be welcoming of young guys between 15 and 24. And in fact, we even graffitied the exterior of three health posts so that the youth could actually see that there was an establishment that had this resonance with, with their own lifestyle. Now, promoting male-friendly health services, as I said, was added to that um, programme. But how do you actually measure changes in attitude and behaviour? Now, drawing on the operational definition of a gender equitable man and on an extensive literature review, a scale to measure the impact of the intervention on attitudes toward gender norms called the Gender Equitable Men's Scale, or GEM, was developed and validated by Instituto Promundo with technical assistance from the Horizons programme. The GEM scale was initially tested with a community-based sample of 742 men aged 15 to 60, which did include 23 young men aged 15 to 24. And this was undertaken in both low and middle income neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro. Those centers were Bangu, Santa Marta, and Botafogo. Less equitable or more traditional attitudes were reported by men from varied socioeconomic backgrounds in both the low and the middle income neighborhoods. Men with lower educational levels tended to hold more inequitable views on gender roles and what it means to be a man. A strong association was found between the GEM scale scores and key health-related outcomes, such as partner violence, contraceptive use, and homophobia. And as I hypothesized, more equitable attitudes were associated with less reported partner violence and higher reported contraceptive use. The GEM scale included 17 items on five key areas related to gender norms. And here you can see those five main domains, which ranged from violence through domestic chores and to homophobia. Looking at some of the subscales, they include men who are always ready to have sex, 
There are times when a woman deserves to be beaten and I would never have a gay friend. A quasi-experimental study compared the impact of different combinations of program activities to identify which are particularly useful for achieving desirable changes in attitudes and behaviours. Three groups of young men, aged 15 to 24, at baseline, were followed over time and were based in three different but fairly homogeneous low-income communities. Young men from these three favelas do not tend to interact with each other, so there was minimal risk of contamination. Program activities were implemented in the communities as follows. In Bangu, there was the combined group education together with community-based lifestyle campaign and also the access to healthcare services. In Marais, the focus was purely on the educational component. And then in Moro, Moro dos Macacos, this served as a control. However, there was a delayed intervention and we decided to introduce the peer-led education after six months. The study team considered a 12-month period long enough to expect an impact from the intervention, yet short enough that it was not too much of a burden upon the young men to complete, nor on future organisations that may be interested in implementing it. A technical advisory group comprising members of Program H Alliance and the Population Council selected six months' worth of activities, 18 in total, from the curriculum that was seen as most relevant for promoting gender equity and HIV prevention, and were most successful engaging young men during the field tests. Surveys were administered to a cohort in each site prior to any intervention activities. Then again, after six months, and then further after 12 months. Let's take a look at some of the results. At both intervention sites, and that's excluding the control, condom use at last sex with a primary partner increased with a significant improvement in Bangu. In the control, Moro dos Macacos, there was a slight decrease in condom use at six months. And results at one year follow-up indicated that the improvements in condom use were maintained in both Bangu and Mare. Findings related to STI symptoms were also similar. At both intervention sites, reported STI symptoms over the prior three months decreased. And in Bangu, the site where we saw the educational component combined with lifestyle social marketing, the improvements were statistically significant. And in the control site, there was no significant decrease in reported STI symptoms at the six-month stage. So as we see here and on the previous chart, the positive changes were greater at the one-year follow-up. There was a slight reduction at six months and at one year in the proportion of participants in both intervention groups who reported having two or more sexual partners over the last month and a slight increase in the control group. At six months, agreement with inequitable gender norms significantly decreased in both sites with 10 out of 17 items improving in Bangu and 13 out of 17 items improving in Marais. These positive changes were maintained at the one-year follow-up in both of the sites. And in Moro dos Macacos, responses only one out of the 17 significantly improved. 
As an example of one of the positive changes in Bangu, at baseline, 52% of the young men agreed with the statement, men need sex more than women do, which significantly decreased to 43% at six-month follow-up and then to 37% at the one year. In Mare, 62% of the young men agreed with the statement at baseline, which decreased to 44% at the six-month follow-up, and the decrease was maintained, albeit just slightly, at 43% after 12 months. In the control group, 58% of the young men agreed with the statement at baseline, but this did not significantly change at the six-month follow-up. These findings are similar for other items, two of which are also seen on this chart. In-depth interviews were conducted upon conclusion of the intervention activities with a subsample of young men in ongoing primary relationships with their female sexual partners. The primary goal here was to explore their reactions to the programme, particularly the impact of the programme on their relationships. The young men discussed how the workshops helped them to question their attitudes. I learned to talk more with my girlfriend. Now I worry more about her. It's important to know what the other person wants. Listen to them. Before the workshop, I just worried about myself. Some young men reported that they changed their general views about women and had come to see women as having the same sexual agency as men. Some men reported having new willingness to wait to engage in sexual activity with partners and paying more attention to other aspects of the relationship outside of the sexual component. Young men reported and their female partners confirmed that they engaged more with open communication around sexual risk reduction and paid greater attention to their overall health needs, especially in relation to HIV testing. Facilitators of the educational sessions kept records after each session on the group dynamics, the challenges and successes and also the attendance at the group. This was intended to provide a qualitative assessment of what was discussed and what they thought of the, the group workshops. The costs of implementing the different components of the programme were also tracked to permit a costing analysis. Total costs in Bangu were $36,000 compared to 21000 in Mare. So as a cost per output of the intervention per youth reached, it was $139 in Bangu and 84 in Mare. Therefore, it is almost twice as much to reach young men in a combined programme. However, the analysis focuses on the costs of reaching the young men who participated only in the educational groups. And that number was approximately 500. It does not take into account the many other young men and community members that were reached by the community-based lifestyle social marketing campaign. Therefore, the reach was likely greater than that which the analysis conveys. But what lessons can we learn from the intervention? Programmes working with men to promote gender equality should rely on the voices of the men and women at the community level to develop realistic indications of outcome measures. The alternative voices of men who show greater equity should inform programme development. These young men 
should also be engaged at all levels of the programme. Evaluation must include both individual men who can be encouraged to question and reflect about general traditional views and also the community where the norms are actually promoted. Young men don't, le don't learn behaviours in isolation. Social norms play an important role and from the study we learn that individual reflection can help change their views, which is a first step in changing what is appropriate and expected behaviour for men. Attitude questions applied through a questionnaire as well as through qualitative research should be combined so that we understand how change takes place and can more closely listen to the voices and realities of the women and men involved. The positive changes in attitudes towards gender norms were equally great, were equally great for young men exposed to the combination of group education activities and community lifestyle social marketing. And the group participating in education alone. The finding underscores that the group education was likely the most successful in addressing gender-related attitudes. And an interactive and in interpersonal process may be needed to influence often deep-seated and complex gender-related norms. Improvements in HIV and STI-related outcomes were often greater for younger men exposed to the combined intervention. This finding highlights the importance of combining the interpersonal communication and reinforcing gender equity and HIV risk reduction messages at the community level. In addition, exposing the young men to similar messages outside of the small group setting will likely increase the probability of sustained change over a longer period of time. Qualitative data indicates that young men were resistant to the idea of mutual monogamy in relationships. So interventions regarding the issue of this population may take substantially longer to be effective. And qualitative findings emphasise the complexity of measuring and influencing attitudes towards those gender norms. Young men and women sometimes have inconsistent views, holding gender equitable views about one issue but not another. Young men also show different behaviours with different partners, reflecting the complexity and interactive nature of relationship styles. The issues of tolerance towards homosexuality and the desire for men to have more se multiple sexual partners proved to be among the most difficult areas to challenge. In-depth couple interviews, separate interviews with both partners, provided a number of insights on the nature of male-female couple relationships amongst the young people 15 to 24 in these low-income settings. Insights that are useful for understanding how to promote gender equity and reduce HIV. There was no such thing as a typical relationship amongst the young people. Some couples had been together for two months or less, others for as long as two years. Some had children together. Some young men took on the father role. For children, their partners had perhaps with a previous partner. Others had children with a previous partner. Few couples actually lived together. The majority certainly did not. None were legally married. 
This suggests that interventions and prevention activities must take into account the diversity of relationship styles and realities. The impact of Program H should be viewed within the context of the relationships and those lives in a state of flux. Among the couples interviewed, there was a high degree of instability in their relationships, suggesting that their lives with each other were in that flux. Some young men had children with different partners, had taken on new partners, or had even changed their jobs during the study period. This complicates the ability to understand the impact of the intervention. In addition, in addition, among some young men, a maturational process of gravitating towards more stable, committed relationships as they grew older was perceived by the researchers during the analysis of the interviews. The workshop process could have contributed to this maturation, while some was happening anyway. There was a consistent difficulty in questioning the widely accepted social norm that men can and should have secondary partners. Men's sexuality was seen by both women and men as uncontrollable in many of the couple interviews, even when there were changes in discourses towards becoming more gender equitable. Even among these young men, whose female partners indicated that they were reasonably gender equitable, there was widespread acknowledgement that men inherently sought outside partners. And this is particularly challenging for us to address. Intense relationships, the Program H workshops, were often seen as safe spaces to discuss and reflect. Respondents viewed the workshops as places where young men could vent their frustrations and talk with male peers about important issues. Some of the young men interviewed were highly appreciative of this opportunity, even when there was no self-reported positive behaviour change. This echoes the comment by the facilitators that the group discussions became safe spaces for young men to discuss the issues they rarely discussed in the community. While having such a space to discuss personal issues may not be in and of itself enough to change behaviours, in the short term, positive behaviour change may take place in the future. These findings highlight some of the challenges of trying to promote more gender equitable relationships. They underscore the importance of being aware of the complexities of the relationships and in society and actively addressing them. They also point to the importance of triangulating the data so multiple sources can support a more complete picture of the situation. A number of lessons were learned through the process of recruiting young men to participate in the study and during the implementation of the intervention. Information from the monitoring reports and attendance lists from the facilitators, interviews with the research and programme staff and statements from the young men themselves and their female partners provides the following findings. The attendance of the young men in the groups was uneven. While a substantial minority, almost 30%, attended all of the majority of the sessions, more than half of the group participated in less than half. Young men did not tend to drop out permanently, however, and instead reported that they periodically missed sessions for a variety of reasons. The most common reason for missing the session was work-related. Participation 
also varied by specific workshop. Some groups of young men had a higher average attendance and some facilitators were more effective in engaging the young men and thus encouraged them to participate more consistently. While the education sessions did build upon one another, each session addressed a key topic in, gender, in a gender-sensitive way, which could actually stand alone, so the young men could actually miss sessions, but still receive important information about gender-related issues. In general, it was more difficult to recruit older youth, principally those between 20 and 24, since they were either working or searching for work, and because they prioritised participation in professional training courses offered by other groups within the community. However, those older youth that did attend often displayed more involvement and interest in the session topics, likely because they had more experience with intimate relationships. It was challenging to implement the intervention in these low-income communities, which were characterised by violence. The influence of drug trafficking gangs, which I mentioned earlier, often hindered the participation of the young men in the workshops and exposed both them and the facilitators to the risk of violence. The study team kept in regular contacts with community-based neighbourhood associations as well as with the young men to discuss current levels of safety in the neighbourhoods. On several occasions, workshops had to be suspended because of shootouts between drug traffickers and police. The facilitators of the group education sessions noted a number of other issues. For example, many young men reported a lack of confidence in the sexual health and disease prevention services provided in their local health posts. Condoms are available at these health posts for free, yet the young men reported that when they visited the health posts to get them, they were often asked, who are you going to have sex with and why? They interpreted this questioning as disparaging and were deterred from visiting the health posts again. And that's why it was important that we interfaced with the healthcare professionals to make those facilities really inviting uh, for the youngsters. And several young men reported that they appreciated the group sessions because they provided new information about sexuality or a chance to learn about reproductive facts related to women, such as the fertile period. They simply hadn't understood this information previously. And it was important that they could also understand uh, about women's sexual pleasure. During the study, but not related to it, there was a hiring process for community health agents as part of the public health system in both intervention communities. Some of the young men from the groups sought positions as community health agents. The young men reported that the information gained in the, in the workshops was applicable to this work opportunity. The intervention curriculum also helped participants to study for exams required when applying for community health-based posts. Some of the young men who participated in the study decided to start their own informal groups to continue meeting and discussing similar issues after the completion of the study. At one year follow-up, this group was still meeting, and in Marais, one of the young men was hired as a community health agent and decided to continue the specific discussions on violence, drug abuse, and sexual and reproductive health issues on an informal basis. The community violence previously mentioned was directly reflected in the sessions. Many young men disputed, dis disputed over who actually spoke. They interacted with each other using threats 
and were generally disrespectful towards the facilitator. In such cases, it was important that facilitators felt trained and equipped to handle these conflicts and the style of interaction, and that they consistently promoted a style of discussion that encouraged tolerance and respect towards one another. Following the success of Program H in Rio de Janeiro, the study and intervention inspired ongoing adap adaptations in other countries such as India and Mexico. And components of the program are being implemented in 30 countries around the world, including Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania and Peru, Central America as well, Nicaragua, Costa Rica and Panama and also throughout the Balkans and in Vietnam. The results have seen the UNFPA recognise Program H as the best intervention to engage with young men on gender issues. And by UNESCO and the Inter-American Development Bank for best practices in policies and programmes for youth in Latin America and the Caribbean. And building on the success in educating young men about the social and health costs of Mimikismo culture. Program M, M for Mulheres or Mujeres, the words for women in Portuguese and Spanish, to empower young women to take control of their sexual and reproductive health was launched. It too includes educational and campaign strategies that engage young women in critical reflections about life choices, health and sexuality. Using similar intervention design strategies as Program H, Program M was built on research that explored women's concepts of empowerment and the key facilitators that contribute to their feelings of autonomy and self-worth. And finally, Program D, D, program D, afraid of what? The D is for diversity, and this was created to promote a greater understanding and respect for sexual diversity and gender. The issues of tolerance towards homosexuality, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the most difficult areas to challenge. So in summary, the study findings indicate that confronting inequitable gender norms, particularly those related to rigid and traditional views of masculinity, is an important element of HIV prevention strategies. The positive results suggest that it is in fact possible to question those inequitable views about manhood and in turn change <coughs> the attitude and behaviours of young men in ways that are good for the health of themselves and also for their partners. Thank you.